It's difficult um, giving somebody else's talk, so what I'm going to try and do here is I haven't um, fiddled with Jagisha's slides, but I work with her quite closely, so I'm going to try and give you my take on what she'd say. I've just included one slide here, just so you can see Jagisha, who heads up the Research Integrity Group at Biomed Central. Um, uh, we're a group who work quite closely together. Uh, my colleagues here, Maria, our biology editor, Stephanie, our medical editor, and Magda and Pauline, our associate editors, who are often the first port of call when dealing with um, particular issues. So together, we provide advice to editors, peer reviewers, and authors on all aspects of research and publication ethics and help to work with editors in defining and maintaining um, Biomed Central's editorial policies. So um, to give you an overview of the talk, I'm going to discuss a case of peer review manipulation that occurred at Biomed Central that surfaced in November 2014. Um, some of the challenges we faced in detecting that and what we can think about in terms of preventing peer review manipulation in future. So what do we mean by peer review manipulation? Um, this is the definition. Any attempt to prevent or inappropriately influence the independent assessment of a piece of scientific work by a peer. Um, and that can range from the extreme cases that we've already seen, but it can even be at the day-to-day, -day, every level, where editors are faced with an author submitting a manuscript and saying, please don't use X, Y, Z. <laughs> and they've uh, taken out all the peer reviewers that an editor would normally want to approach. We've seen previous isolated cases of peer review manipulation. I think these first came to light at COPE um, in 2012, I think. The first cases were brought to council for discussion. Um, and we've also seen um, isolated cases of individual authors themselves um, manipulating the peer review process. So that was Moon. This is the example given um, in Journal of Enzyme Inhibition in 2010. And then Peter Chen um, uh, in Journal of Vibrational control, which was a, a SAGE journal. But this is the case that Biomed Central found. Um, so I'm going to talk you through this flow diagram. So the first um, uh, way it came to light, if you like, is that an, an in-house editor was just performing a routine manuscript check. Um, and the peer reviewer name, um, the associated email with that peer reviewer name looked suspicious. So that just raised alarm bells and, and made her think, well, that's a bit of an odd email address for this person. So she put the email address into our peer reviewer user database and looked that person up and found that they occurred and had peer reviewed other manuscripts in the system. So the problem began to expand. And that peer reviewer was not just alone as an odd email address. There were other odd email addresses coming up. So we could then put those email addresses back into the system and find yet more manuscripts. Um, and what was quite um, weird to us at the time was how unconnected manuscripts, this wasn't, didn't have, it wasn't a case of Moon or Chen, it didn't have an author in common, how unconnected manuscripts from unconnected authors um, in overlapping fields were suggesting the same peer reviewers. Um, so the process continued, and in the end, we ended up with a list of suspicious email addresses. Um, the reviewers were all suggested by the authors, and um, it's just interesting to pick up on the different cases um, that were discussed earlier. The review reports were quite credible. In fact, they weren't returned quickly. They were, were returned after chases. Sometimes it was the third chase, so it looked kind of typical, like this typical behavior where people respond after the third chase for their report. Um, they were credible in that they didn't just say, oh, really lovely work, publish. They picked out flaws with the manuscript um, and, and pointed out errors in the manuscript. So they looked reasonable. Um, there was a similar structure to the review reports. Often they followed a, a, a bullet-pointed list of issues that were wrong. Um, in some cases, there were real researchers, but with unusual email addresses. And in some cases, there was no publication record at all. But it was the pattern across unrelated manuscripts and journals which caused alarm. So just to um, tie that together then, the standard checks at manuscript level here flagged the problem, but the standard checks alone did not reveal the scale of the problem. And I think this is something that publishers are grappling with. You might see it and catch it on an isolated case, but 
our systems are not set up to reveal patterns across um, different journals published by one publisher. So it was the pattern that caused suspicion. And in the end, we came to the conclusion that it looked like the authors and the peer reviewers weren't themselves manipulating the process, but perhaps it was a third party, probably an editing service offering support for authors seemingly to offer support for authors. So our immediate steps then were to switch off the ability for authors to suggest peer reviewers on our submission system just so that we could um, take a step back and think, what, what can we do? We had to stop the influx that were continuing to come in. And Jagisha posted a blog at the time, so we were quite transparent about this in November 2014, saying, this is what we found, we don't know what it's about, um, but we're turning off the facility by which authors can suggest peer reviewers, so we were open about that. And we had meetings with other publishers through COPE to discuss the problem. Um, we shared information about our findings, and we were unclear at this point in time the level of author awareness of the peer review manipulation, and we were unclear who entered the proposed reviewer names and details into the system. But it was certainly the case that confidence in peer review was undermined. So after discussion, the decision was taken to retract the articles, not in any way to punish the authors, but just to say, you know, we, we can't have confidence in, in what we've published. Um, so we contacted the authors and um, asked for an explanation, and we also informed the institutions of our intention to retract. And this is the COPE statement that was published in December 2014. Um, so that was great that they were also very supportive and, and uh, it was very transparent what was happening. So following on from that, further manual searches were conducted. In actual fact, 43 published articles were identified, and a number of manuscripts that were in the system were, but had not yet been published were also identified and rejected. We contacted the authors, and this was also not easy. Um, it's very unsure who you're contacting in these situations. Many came back um, with gen looking like genuinely upset emails, saying they were unaware. Some said they'd used an agency, and um, sometimes we got quite aggressive responses, which looked probably like we were actually just talking to the agency, um, saying it was just as much um, you know, our fault as, as the authors, and, and there is some truth in that. So we contacted the institutions to ask them to investigate and inform them of our intention to retract. And this was the retraction notice um, that we published, and we published the same retraction notice across all of the articles and it's important to note that the publisher and editor are also taking responsibility jointly for what happened so we're saying who's retracting here and why because the peer review process was inappropriately influenced and we're not sure of the scientific integrity of the articles we also referenced the cope statement in the retraction notice to be really transparent and we made sure that we said it's not possible to know, you know just how much the authors were aware of what was going on. We did take the decision to permanently remove the functionality for authors to suggest reviewers during submission. However, authors can still suggest potential reviewers for their manuscripts um, in their cover letters. We think it's, it's, the, it's just the ease with which busy editors can click through author suggestions that was the problem. Um, if you have to look at an author suggestion in a cover letter, think who that person is, look up their email address, enter them, that hopefully that would be a sort of second check on the process. Um, and we raised awareness amongst our external editors and um, we uh, blogged about this, we talked to people about this so that um, junior researchers and funders were aware. And we also thought, what can we do proactively in this situation? So rather than reactively wait for a problem to happen, um, in our um, audits of our journals, we actually were, um, we've actually started to actually look for this problem and, and see if we can find it and address patterns. This is an example of a slide given from one of our author workshops to authors who are going to submit manuscripts on how to avoid some of the potential pitfalls. It's really important that they never hand over total control of a manuscript to anybody who's not an author. I'm not an author. If they want to use an agency, and there are very many reputable agencies out there who can offer copy editing services to authors, then either make it clear that they're acting on your behalf, or ideally, once the manuscript's been refined, um, take back control and submit that manuscript yourself. 
We were slightly in an awkward situation with the institutions because um, we, we wanted to act swiftly with what we found. We wanted to correct the scientific integrity of the literature, so we didn't allow enough time for institutions to conduct their own investigations. Perhaps in hindsight, that's something that we could have handled better. Um, so um, as institutions did conduct their own investigations, after we published the retraction notices, some of them got in touch with us and said, this is what we found. And we thought that even though it sort of looks messy to have to update retraction notices, we felt it was um, transparent to do so and actually update retraction notices and report back on what institutions had found. So this is an update to one of those retraction notices. Um, and of course, it's not, not an isolated case. Other publishers have also um, been hit by this. Um, so it's not, it's not just Biomed Central. And that's reassuring in a way that it's not just a problem, you know, typical of open access, for, for example. And I really applaud um, other editors um, standing up to, um, to actually be open about what they found and, and the editorial that has been referred to here published by Wiley in the British Journal of Clinical Pharmacology. I think it's kudos to them that they actually um, uh, shared their experience. How can we um, detect and prevent peer, peer review manipulation in the future? Um, I think that these are great challenges. Jagisha asked the question here, are, are researchers and authors somehow being exploited and, and what pressures are they under to publish? And I think there's always been a pressure to publish for people to secure the next publication, to secure the next grant, to get tenure. But it seems that we're really seeing quite um, perverse incentives that are put on authors by institutions that they're paid huge sums of money to publish in journals. And that that's only fueling this sort of behavior. Is it realistic to expect editors of individual journals to detect peer review manipulation? One would hope if they're fi purely fictitious emails that any editor would pick that up. But if people are being so devious as to slightly change an email address, Elizabeth Moylan looks on topic to review this particular manuscript. I'll just invite her. Didn't really notice that a Gmail address was provided. I, you know, maybe we have some sympathy there. For publishers, can we overcome our competitiveness and actually work together? Um, it's one thing for a publisher to face a situation and solve it. Um, that might then pass on to another publisher. What can we do together and work together on this? Um, and for institutions and employers, even funders, can we find alternative ways to measure success uh, and remove this pressure to publish and recognize people for more than just publishing in a journal? With peer review, there's been so much innovation recently and there's been so much drive to making the peer review process more efficient but perhaps the focus is shifting slightly now on preventing manipulation as well as increasing efficiency. And I know Jagisha is very passionate about training for peer review as that question came up from the audience. And actually having some accreditation for peer reviewers, maybe we need a database of certified peer reviewers or something like that um, so that we know who these peer reviewers are. Um, so in summary then, the peer review manipulation patterns that we see from those isolated cases of authors to um, third parties manipulating the system is becoming more sophisticated. It's occurring across journals and publishers, and it's really challenging to address. I've heard Sharon Pearson and Ginny Barber give talks on behalf of COPE where they refer to um, publication ethics as a sort of a, a, wicked, a wicked problem, if you like, which was a, a term coined by Rittle in 1973, um, where it's not, it's not wicked in, in the sense of being evil. It's just really hard to grasp what we need to fix and how we can go about it. While there are some pragmatic steps that we can take, and that might be you know, switching off the facilities for authors to suggest peer reviewers, that's addressing a symptom. It's not addressing the cause. Um, and so perhaps further innovations in peer review may help. And it's certainly the case that collaboration and cooperation is key. So um, more information uh, is given just on, on the, the things I've talked about on the blogs that were published here. Um, and with that, I'd just like to say thank you very much for listening, and I'm happy to take questions.